Okay, so we're going to talk about techniques used for sterilization and disinfection. And of course, antisepsis, which is sterilizing live tissue, your skin, for example. Um, so sterilization is basically going to be a process that kills everything. And this includes things like spores. And then disinfectants are going to be more static and you're gonna have different levels. Some levels are gonna to get to as high as sterilization, um, and some are gonna be very much lower. And then antisepsis, of course, is going to be where you sterilize um, live tissue and protect it from, typically in a hospital setting, you're going to protect it from getting infected and ultimately producing sepsis. So before we get into this, I just want to talk about a few things. Um, there are going to be some agents that are more difficult to destroy than others, and those agents are going to be toxins. So this is going to be anywhere from ricin um, to anthrax to staph enterotoxin. Um, botulinum toxin, pertussis, tetanus, etc. Uh, we have spores, so some bacteria can form spores and those are more difficult because of their structure. And also the prion protein. And in general, autoclaving is where you heat um, and under pressure, you heat up to 121 degrees at least or more and put under pressure is going to have an effect on most things. Um, spores, you can autoclave. And there is actually a bacteria that produces spores that is used in order to test the efficacy of autoclaving. Um, and this is going to be tested using those spores. So you put in the spores of a bacillus. Thermophilus. And then prion protein is also going to be for autoclaving. Um, but you have to add, um, you're going to add a sodium hydroxide or sodium hypochlorite. So in the presence of sodium hydroxide or sodium hypochlorite. And toxins are variable. Now toxins, um, there are many publications on what to do if you suspect toxin and need to inactivate toxins. So steam autoclaving, again, um, for one hour, will get rid of many toxins. So that's gonna get rid of cholera, diphtheria, pertussis, ricin, um, tetanus. Um, anthrax will require sodium, um, hypochlorite. So that's sodium hypochlorite. And so it just depends on the type of toxin, but these things are a little bit more harder to um, neutralize than many other substances that are in the hospital environment. So with respect to this topic, you have to understand certain terms, and a lot of them overlap. Um, some are more general, some are going to be more specific. So in general, an antiseptic and, um, is going to be where you have living skin, and you're trying to add a um, compound to reduce infection or sepsis. Um, iodine is commonly used, and so there are more... Um, softer forms of iodine that don't dry out the skin so much. Alcohol can be used, but alcohol also does dry out the skin by removing the lipids in your skin, your um, cell membranes. Aseptic is simply a term that means free from contamination, so it's a very general term. And then you get into more of the bactericidal, bactericidal, so bactericidal versus bactericidal. Um, 
Cytol means that you're killing the bacteria. Static means that you're stopping the bacteria. And so they, um, it just depends on what you're trying to um, sterilize or disinfect because sometimes you can't put things into an autoclave, for example, because it'll destroy, be destroyed in the autoclave, things like plastics. Um, and so you have to use other types of disinfectants and they might not be um, able to kill the bacteria, but they might stop the bacteria from reproducing. And over time that will, of course, cause the bacteria to die. Uh, disinfectant is a chemical liquid that kills bacteria and a germicide is going to be some agent that destroys microbes and germicide and antiseptics are often used um, interchangeably. And then we also have our um, sanitization versus sterilization. So we have sanitizing, so we're eliminating the pathogens on the surface. And then sterilization is a term used to make something free from bacteria or another type of pathogen. So these are just terms to keep in mind as we go through um, this lecture. Okay, so I just basically took the different types of agents and tied them to a function within the actual microbe you're targeting. So agents that are going to disrupt lipids in the cell membrane are things like alcohol. We know that dries out your skin. But remember, bacteria have um, fat in their membrane, and so do um, your uh, fungi. And so what it does to your skin, it's going to do to them as well. So alcohol, phenols, and detergents are all going to disrupt the lipid membrane. There are going to be some other agents that are going to modify proteins. And so these are things like chlorine, bleach, um, iodine. We have um, silver nitrite drops that are used for neonate gonococcal um, conjunctivitis, and that's to disrupt the proteins in that bacterium. Um, there's hydrogen peroxide, formaldehyde, fludalehyde, formaldehyde is in the two cancer. So in a lot of these, you have to be careful about when you use and how you use them. And then we also have some that are going to modify DNA. And so we have dyes such as crystal violet, which is used in a typical gram stain dye, um, which will get in and alter um, DNA. Now there also are physical agents. We have autoclaving, um, and this typically leads to a sterilization. And just keep in mind that prion proteins are going to require um, sodium hypochlorite or sodium hydroxide while it's going through sterilization in the autoclave. And autoclaving is very important because autoclaving is going to bring the temperature up higher than 121 degrees and it's going to add pressure. And the combination of pressure and temperature is really what's going to make um, the autoclave work. So your autoclaves work. You can also do filtrations. Um, filtrations are very nice when you cannot autoclave something. So if you have some sort of fluid um, that you're worried that you have it contaminated, you can put it through a filtration, 40 micron filter, for example, and that will eliminate bacteria from and also fungi from your liquid that you cannot put into an autoclave, for example. Um, Toxins are more resistant to autoclaving, as we discussed, but some can be um, neutralized by your autoclave. And then just as a note, pasteurization is when you heat milk to 62 degrees, and then you put it through rapid cooling. So autoclaving obviously would not be used for milk. It would destroy proteins in milk. And so milk is only heated up to about 62 degrees. Just as a side note, to neutralize a virus, you usually take put it up to about 59 degrees um, for about 30 minutes. Radiation can also be used, ultraviolet light, and in this case you're going to um, break the, the links in DNA. Um, X-rays are also going to be used, and again, X-ray can be used to sterilize heat-sensitive items. Um, some hospital equipment have rubber on them, for example. And you don't want to put that into an autoclave, and so you would use other mechanisms of um, inactivating them uh, other than autoclaving.
so here's just a list I put up together just to give you some ideas about what is used in a clinical setting. So for your hands, um, for an antiseptic, um, chlorine hexadine is going to be commonly used. You can also use some form of iodine, iodine iodophore, for example, used on the skin for a surgical site. Prior to a veni puncture or immunization, you would only use about a 70% ethanol. You're just applying it very um, to one small area, uh, and it's rapidly available. Um, and so that's typically used for an immunization. In an operating room, when it's not in use, you will have ultraviolet lights available that will um, disinfect the entire room, so if you turn those on. Um, and again, if there are any microbes present, it will cross-leave their DNA and will cause them not to be able to replicate. Um, for the floor of an operating room, you can use chloride or Lysol. Stethoscope, you're going to want to use 70% ethanol. Um, and then skin prior to a blood culture or a vascular catheter insertion, you're going to use iodine followed by 70% ethanol or iodo for um, and so you have to do a little bit more when you're going to insert something into someone. So I just want to go over some standard precautions. Um, one thing to note is that we have biosafety levels. And so there's biosafety levels one through four. So one, basically, you are dealing with an agent that does not cause disease in humans. And so an example of this is your normal for a staph, staph epidermidis, in a healthy person. And then the next level is going to be two. And this is where the microbe does cause disease, um, but it's non-lethal or there is a vaccine or treatment for it. Um, and it usually has low transmission. And then we have biosafety level three, and this is going to be higher transmission and it's going to have disease causing with no treatment. And then commonly, you're going to have an aerosol transmission with these. And then the high one is four, and this is going to be lethal with no treatment. And so an example for four is going to be Ebola or hemorrhagic um, diseases are also going to be in these um, higher areas. We have um, hantavirus and things like that. A three would be our um, TB and SARS-CoV-2. Um, an example of two is going to be HIV, measles, some flu, we'll put some flu as three. And so basically universal precautions. So regardless of what biosafety level, universal precautions are, or standard precautions are going to be gloves, um, hand washing, cough etiquette, um, safe injection practices, and proper sharps disposal. And so this is going to be for all patients.
Now, if you're going to be exposed to potential blood or body fluids, you're going to have to up your PPE. PPE equals personal protective equipment. And so you're going to have at minimum for blood and body fluids is going to be in addition to um, what we just talked about, you're going to have to have a mask or a face shield. And these are usually disposable. Um, I should have and or. Uh, you're going to have to have gloves, of course. And sometimes you're going to have double gloves. Um, and you're going to have to have a lab coat or a gown, often disposable. Um, other things that can be asked for are booties to cover your shoes, a hairnet, etc. So just follow the rules for wherever you are. Now, if you're going to have uh, interacting with training rules, um, a generalized rash, stool contingents, you have to put on gloves, gown, and you also have to remember to disinfect the room. Now for droplets, if there's respiratory, of course you're going to have to have um, your mask, face shield, and this is typically a full, there are various sizes of face shields, um, gloves, and just, you know, just be, um, uh, use your own ideas about how you want to protect yourself. Airborne precautions are a little bit more, so SARS-CoV-2, TB, measles, um, you're going to want to up the protection level. And even though measles and chickenpox, you do have vaccines available, it's important to protect yourself because you're going to be going from patient to patient to patient. And so you don't want to carry a disease from a patient that you see in one room to a person who has some other illness not associated with that disease in another room. So even though you might be protected, you have to just assume your patients that you're going to be seeing in the future are not protected. And so that means you have to bring to um, a, a room with a very highly contagious, a person suffering from a very highly contagious disease, the highest level of protection you can. And so with respect to airborne precautions, um, as with COVID-19, we learned you have to wear an N95. Um, or a PAPR, and a PAPR is just, um, it's basically a hood that you bring in your own air, so you you have a pump associated with it and filters, so you're going to pump in air and the air is going to be filtered. Um, you have to have a negative pressure room, so whenever you open the door, the air does not blow out into the hallway. It is always blowing into the room, recirculating back into the room. You have to have your personal protective equipment. You're going to have to have double gloves, um, face shield. You're going to have to have an outer covering. Hairnet and booties, and usually these are 2x as well. Okay, so, and that is the end of our disinfection.